Welcome back everyone, it's Charlie. This will be my full House of the Dragon episode 4 video. There were a whole bunch of easter eggs and references, so we'll break it all down. If you're brand new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to get all the episodes. I'll be doing videos for all the episodes, just like I did for the original Game of Thrones series, so careful for spoilers if you haven't seen the episode yet. Starting at the beginning of the episode and working our way through shot by shot, talking about easter eggs and WTF moments, starting with the title of the episode, King of the Narrow Sea, which is a reference to Daemon Targaryen's title that his men call him after they name him King of the Stepstones after they defeat the Triarchy and Crab Feeder. The only big change that I could see in the opening title scene was just the addition of another stream of blood coming from Alicent, Hightower's symbol, to represent the birth of both of her children with Viserys. Helena Targaryen is the second child. You see her trying to comfort her later in the episode. Rhaenyra is fortunate that there's only like two other people contending for the Iron Throne right now, even though nobody is really thinking about Daemon being a potential contender at the moment. The actual opening scene is inside Storm's End. This is the first time I believe we've been inside the castle. We saw the castle during the Game of Thrones episodes, but we never actually went inside. She's with Borman Baratheon. He's the head of their household. He's the one that swore the oath of fealty to her. And they're listening to a bunch of suitors. It's this big marriage tour that her father Viserys and Alicent set up for her because they want to find her husband. And about a year has gone by. So the whole idea is that even though she cuts her tour short and they're really pissed off about that, it had been going on for a long time already. The first person she's listening to when the episode begins is Beric Dondarrion. That will remind you of Beric Dondarrion later in the timeline from the events of Game of Thrones with the Flaming Sword. The Blackhaven castle he's talking about is their main seat of power, and that's the place where Kristen Cole came from, basically. He was born the son of the steward to Lord Dondarrion at the time. So they really want to start foreshadowing all this Kristen Cole Rhaenyra drama early in the episode. Don't worry, I'll get to that too, because they kind of soft confirmed a huge rumor from the books, but there was a huge twist in the interpretation of the rumor, like the truth of the rumor was a big twist. When he mentions Queen Alysanne, her great-grandmother, that was Jaehaerys' wife. They referenced Jaehaerys a couple times in the episode, and Viserys basically tells her, if you'd have been Jaehaerys' daughter, he would have disinherited you, which is another huge deep cut from the books, because that actually did happen to one of Jaehaerys' daughters. He had many children, and all of them met very untimely or very weird fates, which is why things got so bad with the succession during his reign that they had to call that great council of 101 AC. One of his daughters named Sarah got involved in a scandal involving Flea Bottom, very similar to what happened to Rhaenyra in this episode, and she basically fled to the east and he disinherited her. But, big connection to episode one, Sarah eventually followed a bastard child who had a claim to the Iron Throne, like a very loose claim, but a claim nonetheless. So in episode one, when they said 14 claims were heard during the Great Council of 101 AC, one of those claims was from Sarah's bastard. One of the heirs of House Bracken insults the Blackhaven heir. They have a small fight and he winds up killing him. And it's just meant to show you some of the chaos that's going on in the realm because of the issue of her marriage. Setting up the whole idea by the end of the episode that Viserys has all these problems that he eventually tries to solve with one fell blow. Like, okay, we'll solve all these problems and you just wind up marrying Corlys Valerian's son, Laner Valerian here. No more spicy gossip about what you might be up to in Flea Bottom with your uncle or anyone else. And because you'll be claimed by another lord, none of the other lords of the realm will have any reason to start any civil wars over your hand. There are a lot of references to that in the episode too, like them trying to avert a civil war. Like there are all these things that happen, Daemon even asking for Rhaenyra's hand, and Myseria kind of throwing them under the bus to try and save Daemon from himself. I'll talk about that again in a second too, because it was Myseria going full Varys. Varys was master of whispers, so he did all kinds of shady stuff. He had his little birds all over the place. Myseria is kind of filling that role on the show right now. Like she has all these little birds informing her on everything, and she's trying to help Daemon in spite of himself. But as they sail back to the Red Keep, you notice they have a very Targaryen-themed ship, like all these dragon designs all over it. Daemon does a flyby on Caraxes, mostly just to say hello, like he's just kind of messing with her a little bit, on his way to swagger back into the Iron Throne Room. The whole court is there to watch him do his little victory dance. Corlys Valerian's men named him King of the Narrow Sea, King of the Stepstones. Technically, it's not part of Westeros, so that's why he can do that. The actual crown looks like it's made from the bones of either dead triarchy or possibly crab feeder's bones. Like they look like human bones. He also throws down crab feeder's hammer at his brother's feet. So it's like his little victory dance in front of the entire court. Like all the lords of the realm are watching this happen. So it's him working his way back into his brother's graces. I love the scene of them as brothers in the godswood too. Like they're standing underneath the weirwood and Viserys is telling Alicent all these stories about he and his brother when they were younger and how his mother loved Daemon way more because he was just so much more of a badass than he was. 
And when he's talking about how Damon doesn't love tradition, he doesn't care about ceremony or anything like that, it just meant to juxtapose the role of male heirs versus female heirs as he tells Rhaenyra at the end of the episode, like yes, if you were born a male heir, the realm wouldn't really care what you get up to in Flea Bottom, but because you were born a female, there are way greater consequences in the realm's eyes. And it doesn't matter what she actually does, it just matters what they perceive that she did. It looks like in the intervening year, at least before all the drama happens later in the episode, she and Allison have kind of made up a little bit. She's wearing a red and black Targaryen themed dress, which is a bit different. Like people wonder when she's going to start wearing different clothing, because usually you think of Allison, you think of the greens. Like she usually wears a green color for their household. And because she was so infamous for wearing green gowns, why they call her side in the Targaryen Civil War the greens. It also kind of seems like Alicent has started to resent her role in the grand scheme of things. Like she feels kind of like she's a trophy wife. She only exists to birth more potential heirs for Viserys. Which they juxtapose with the very, very spicy scenes later in the episode. Like two different spicy scenes, but one is like the most unsexy version of that scene. And the other is like the most spicy version of that scene. Just to show you what things are like for her day to day. Like she's just kind of like this person that people take for granted. They have that little scene with Damon and Rhaenyra speaking High Valyrian to each other. It's sort of like their own secret language that they speak, but all Targaryens in the family in the royal line of succession here, they all speak High Valyrian. So if Viserys were standing there, he would be able to speak High Valyrian with them too. Because she's of age now, things are way spicier between them. Like there was a little weirdness between the two of them in episode one, but I believe she's meant to be about 12 years younger than Damon. So in episode one, Damon, even though he was having a little bit of fun with her, like they are clearly very close. He wasn't going to take things in that direction. He wasn't really thinking about an actual marriage to her or anything like that at the time. But now clearly that has changed. That's also why he touches the Valyrian necklace that he gave her. They also let you know what things are like for him day to day too, like you get a little bit inside his head. He still hates being married to his wife in the veil, Rhea Royce. Even though she's meant to be like a fairly normal person, like she's not bad or anything like that, he just hates the idea that he was forced to marry her. He gives her a little bit of a pep talk, like marriage isn't so bad and you can pretty much do whatever you want anyway, even if you are married, setting up the later parts of the episode where they do get really spicy. The whole scene of the small council discussing the fallout between House Valerian and the crown is just meant to set up the end of the episode like, okay, we need to solve all these problems. We have a very clear solution here. You will marry Laner Valerian and we will solve all these in one fell swoop. Otto Hightower also briefly mentions the Sea Lord of Bravos, reminding us of all the Arya and Bravos scenes during the Game of Thrones series. We haven't actually traveled to the east, like the Stepstones is the furthest east we've been so far, so we'll see if we actually go to the east at any point during the series. Then we see that Daemon has sent Rhaenyra commoner's clothes in the secret escape route using the Valyrian language, like it's the written Valyrian language, to help her get out of the Red Keep in the secret passages undetected. I don't think that we've actually seen these secret passages in the Red Keep before. They take her past the monument to Balerion the Black Dread and he takes her out for a bit of fun in Flea Bottom. You also notice as they're leaving the Red Keep, in the distance you can see the Dragon Pit. I think that's a reference to what happens later in the episode with Damon talking to her about ignoring the commoner's wishes at her own peril. Like, you need to pay attention to what the commoners, the small folk, think about you because it could bite you in the ass big time later. I don't want to talk too far ahead of the story because a lot of the stuff that they reference in the episode, they'll pay off in either future seasons, maybe a little bit later this season, but mostly future seasons. But at least at this point in the timeline, it seems like she could care less about the wishes of the small folk, and that's a big, big deal. Another funny detail here too, like they spent all this time in Flea Bottom, Damon's other nickname is the Lord of Flea Bottom because he spends so much time here. Like all the spicy stuff that they get up to here is just like a regular Monday night for Damon. They pass the witch on the street that says that she'll tell Rhaenyra how she dies. No spoilers for the books, but like that is played out of the books. You could actually go read that. There's even an episode during Game of Thrones season four, I believe, where Joffrey references what happened to Rhaenyra. So if you have read the books or you do remember that scene from Game of Thrones, please don't post that spoiler in the comments below. But the scene is also meant to be a reference to the Maggie the Frog prophecy scene where Cersei went to learn her future from Maggie the Frog. Even though Rhaenyra doesn't get her future told here, the prophecy that Cersei got did wind up coming true in a very twisty, very WTF kind of way. Then we see Viserys declining health in the intervening year since last week's episode. He has lesions all over his body now. They show his missing digits. He may have lost a couple other digits on his toes too. And it kind of seems like he's in a constant state of dull pain. Like his drink there might be a little bit milk of the poppy. When we go back to Flea Bottom, the play that they're watching on the street is meant to be a mirror of Arya's play. That was called The Bloody Hand, meant to be commentary on the plot of the series. And in this case, they're doing the same thing, but it's all about the succession in the Iron Throne. Who will it be? Will it be Daemon, the brother? Will it be the daughter, Rhaenyra, or the princeling of three, which is Aegon II? With Rhaenyra just having to sit there and listen to them clown on her. 
Remember, the big deal here is that Damon's like, you need to chill out and just listen to what the rest of the common folk think. This is also meant to show you that Damon actually does care about what the small folk think. Like, he does want to help the people of King's Landing. Even though in episode one, they wanted to make him seem like more of a tyrant, which is obviously a bit of a misdirect. Like, he actually does care about people. When she runs off because she doesn't have any money, she bumps into Harwin Strong, which is meant to be a big reference to the joke about the strong boys, because if you notice in the trailers, her first two sons are both brunettes, so there's this nasty rumor that goes around the realm that her sons really belong to Harwin Strong, and they call them the strong boys, instead of being Laner Valerian's sons, because he has silver hair just like she does. It'll give you big flashbacks to Game of Thrones season one. The seed is strong. Like, why don't any of Robert Baratheon's children have brown hair like his? Oh, because they're not Robert Baratheon's children. We have our maximum spice scene with Daemon and Rhaenyra, where he basically stops things before they get too crazy. I think what's going on here is that he does love the chaos just a little bit. Like, there's a little bit of that little finger energy in him. But he also loves his family, and he does actually genuinely care about Rhaenyra. So that's why he asks Viserys later, genuinely, for her hand in marriage. Like, let me marry her, and we will restore the House of the Dragon. He also said the name of the show in the show. He did the thing again. So did Viserys later in the episode. Two people in the episode said it. He wants to take their family back to a more biblical era in their history. Back to what their family used to be like during the time of Aegon the Conqueror. Which is why I think he stopped things before they went too far here. Like, they have a little bit of fun, but then he's like, okay, no, no, like, we can't, we can't do this. We have to do it officially. Otherwise, things are going to get really, really nasty in the realm. And that's why I think that Masseria, who they call the White Worm later in the episode, actually informs on him to Otto Hightower because she's trying to protect the realm and protect him from himself. Kind of like Varys did during the original Game of Thrones series, where he said, I'm a servant of the realm. I want to help the realm, which is why I think a Targaryen restoration will help the realm and why I'm helping Daenerys. And I think Maseria probably thought that if Daemon were to actually marry Rhaenyra, it would only cause an even greater civil war. It would split the realm, which is ironic because that winds up happening anyway. The whole idea that right now half the realm thinks that Aegon II should be on the Iron Throne, the other half thinks that Rhaenyra should. But if right now Rhaenyra married Daemon, then that would get even worse. Like I said, it's ironic because this is building towards the actual Dance of the Dragons where that very literal thing happens. You could also draw a connection back to episode two, I believe it was, where Corlys said to Viserys, you should never try to await a storm, always sail around it or into it. You can think of the storm as being the Dance of the Dragons, but also being Rhaenyra and Daemon together. Then they pay off that huge twist on the long-running Harwin Strong rumor with the Kristen Cole and Rhaenyra scene. They wind up getting it on, and at the end of the episode where the Grand Maester brings her the moon tea, you don't see her actually take it. So you're like, wait, wait a minute, did, did she take it? Did she not take it? Does this mean that her first son, Jacaris, who's born the year after this episode, is actually Kristen Cole's son, instead of being Harwin Strong's son? So that's what I mean when they say they pay off the big Harwin Strong rumor with a twist, because it's not Harwin Strong, it might actually be Kristen Cole's son. You can let me know in the comments if you actually believe that. Do you actually think that she's pregnant at the end of the episode and did not take the moon tea? Everybody's going to be on belly watch after next week's episode. Like how much time goes by and how quickly does she give birth? Then when they have the scene of Otto throwing Damon under the bus, like I said, the white worm is a reference to Viserya. And to Damon's credit, Viserys immediately thinks that Otto is lying to him. There have been a lot of people during this series so far that have suspected that he's been playing this long con to position his family closer to the Iron Throne through an heir, through Aegon II now. The way the showrunners talk about the character, the way that Reese Zephons talks about Otto Hightower, the character he plays, is that he tries to do what he thinks is best for the realm, but there's the question of his judgment. Like, is this better for the realm, or is this better just for your family? Like, is this just advantageous to your family? Feel kind of bad for Alicent Hightower, too, because Viserys kind of throws her under the bus, too. Like, ah, oh, you clearly threw her at me. I knew what's going on this whole time now. It just took me a little while to figure it out. I think part of the idea, too, by the end of the episode is that Allison also kind of feels that same energy, too. Like, she feels as if she's been thrown at Viserys and nobody really cares about actual her. Like, they just use her as a tool. You notice the day after that Rhaenyra and Kristen Cole do the deed, even though she's trying to be kind of cute with him, she's not wearing Damon's necklace anymore because she kind of hates him right now. And then when she has the conversation with Allison, the reason why Allison is, like, so against her being with Damon, because that's pretty normal for their family, like, why would she be so against it? is because she's disgusted by the idea of the Targaryen's practice of sister wiving just in general. And the reason why is because she's this hugely devout person of the Faith of the Seven. You notice in all the trailers, she's wearing the seven-pointed star necklace around her neck. The whole idea with the High Towers is they come from Old Town, but before King's Landing existed, before Aegon's Conquest, the Great Sept and the High Septon were down in Old Town, so the High Towers had this strong connection with the Faith for thousands of years. 
So that's why she comes off as being such a goody goody girl. And the whole idea is the Faith of the Seven absolutely hated Aegon the Conqueror and his sister wiving and all the other sister wiving that happened later in their family. In fact, Jaehaerys Targaryen, who they reference a couple times in the episode, actually had to drop a legal document and legalize the practice of the Targaryen sister wiving so that the Faith wouldn't start another war with them. So because Allison is such a devout follower of the Faith and they hate sister wiving, that's why Allison hates sister wiving so much. And when Daemon gets hauled in and raked over the coals by Viserys, the reason why he doesn't try to deny the allegations is because he actually does want to marry Rhaenyra. So he's like, who cares? What does it matter? So like he's actually asking him here, like, let us return the House of the Dragon, saying the name of the show, in the show again, to its former glory. And even though they didn't make it very clear in the episode, Viserys is very against Rhaenyra marrying Daemon. Like, he doesn't want them to get together at all. Not because he hates Daemon, just because he doesn't want to see that happen. Like, he doesn't like the idea of a sister wiving their family so much. And just for reference, Daemon and Viserys' parents, which they mentioned a couple times in the episode, they referenced their mother and they referenced their father, Balon Targaryen, Balon the Brave. They were actually brother and sister, so they were even more closely related than Viserys and his wife, who was his cousin, basically. Daemon and Rhaenyra getting together is kind of like Jon Snow and Daenerys getting together. Like, the aunt getting together with the nephew, only this time it's flipped, is the older uncle getting together with the younger niece. You also notice Daemon keeps trying to slide by in technicalities, like Aegon the Conqueror had two wives, why don't you let me have two wives? Then Viserys gives Rhaenyra another cool history lesson in front of his giant model of the Valyrian Freehold. When he heats up the Valyrian Dagger, he explains that Aegon's Valyrian pyromancers are the ones who etched the prophecy of A Song of Ice and Fire on it, the prophecy of the prince who was promised, which is a Jon Snow reference, you could also call it a Daenerys reference too. Because in High Valyrian, there's no word to distinguish between prince and princess. Like, the word for prince is the same word as princess. He also says the blade belonged to Aenar Targaryen before Aegon. Aenar was his ancestor who sailed the entire Targaryen family, took their holdings from Valyria to Dragonstone after Danis the Dreamer, his daughter, had the vision of the doom. That was about seven generations before Aegon the Conqueror was born. And then he says it's hard to know who the dagger belonged to before Aenar Targaryen, just claiming that the dagger itself is much, much older than we believe. But it does confirm my theory that Aegon the Conqueror just inscribed the prophecy on the dagger, like the dagger already existed and he just modified it a little bit. The reason he also shows her the prophecy again is to remind her about her obligation to guard against the Long Night, the White Walkers, the Night King. I already explained the Jaehaerys reference here when he talks about disinheriting her, the daughter that Jaehaerys had that he did wind up disinheriting. During the episode when she talks to Daemon about bastards and just doing whatever you want and then to Viserys about the same thing basically, like you can do whatever you want. That's also them referencing Viserys' bastard who's named Tristan Truefire. He then decides to solve all their problems by having her marry Laenor Valerian, like all the problems just in general. But she agrees only on the condition that he basically get rid of Otto Hightower as Hand of the King. When he's talking to Otto Hightower in the room of the small council, he talks about the circumstances of his father, Balon's death. His father died very suddenly after complaining of a stitch in his side while on a hunting trip, which is also meant to be a bit of a reference to the events of episode 3 when they were on the hunt and what happened to Robert Baratheon dying after going on a hunting trip of his own. So if you actually have a shot of sitting on a throne somewhere wearing a crown, do not go on any hunting trips anytime soon. He also references that his father Balon rode Vagar, the biggest dragon that's alive in the timeline right now. That's important for later, so just remember that he mentioned Vagar. I think we'll see her in next week's episode, but at least by the episode after that. They've been teasing Vagar for like the last couple of episodes. And when he says his father's belly burst, I think the reason his father died was probably from a burst appendix. And then obviously at the end of the episode, they end with that big WTF moment where the Grand Maester brings Rhaenyra the moon tea, but you don't see her take it. So you're like, wait a minute, if her first child is going to be born like a year after the events of this episode, does that mean that her child really belongs to Kristen Cole? Things just got way spicier. Post all your theories about that in the comments below. Did she actually take the moon tea? Like, is she pregnant at the beginning of next week's episode? If you spotted any other big Easter eggs or references in the episode that I didn't talk about in the video, just write them below in the comments. My episode 5 trailer video will post next, and my full episode 5 video will post next week after they release it. Everyone click here for my House of the Dragon episode 5 trailer video. I'll update the link as soon as I post that. And click here for all my other House of the Dragon videos. Thank you so much for watching. Everyone stay safe, and I'll see you guys in the next one.